Hey neighbor, we got a wonderful show today. I'm talking about one I've been looking forward to a long time. We got Tanya going to be on the show with us from Waters Lab. Tanya's an agronomist and she knows soils. And I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about the ins and outs of soil samples. And we're probably going to, going to bust up some of these myths that you guys have out there on certain issues. We're going to talk about all things soils and soil samples. Wonderful show. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us, man. Whew, we got a lot going on. We do, we do. Mm. Flowers are blooming. Flowers again. are blooming. I have flowers in the house. Yep. Awesome. We still got turmeric for sale, folks. We still got a little bit, not a lot, but we still have some turmeric. So if you want to get your turmeric, and look, if it's not time for you to plant it, you can hold this stuff. It holds really good, and you can plant it next. Now you need to get it planted before probably June, but you can plant it. It keeps really good. Just plant it when you have a when you have your spot ready, or you know, plant it containers or whatever. Somebody you, asked if um if they decided not to plant it, could they use that? Yes, you can eat that. I had a lady this morning that uh, emailed this organic turmeric USA grown, so you could eat it. So there you have. It. If you don't plant it, you can eat it. How about that? All right. So knife of the week. I had to dig into my drawer to find this one right here. This is a folder right here called Northfield. It looks like a case, but it is your traditional type knife right here, made in USA. I believe, I'm, I'm almost positive, this is made by Great Eastern Cuttery out of the state of New York here. But it is a USA made knife. It's the uh, carbon steel right here. You can tell it's starting to get tarnished a little bit right here. I have three or four of their knives. Uh, they're kind of hard to get, but every time I, I can get my hands on one, I try to get one. Uh, it's, it's your traditional folder there. It's, it's pretty tight there. Boop, folds back in there. Wood handle there. So that is Knife of the Week Northfield Cuttery, if you want to look it up there. It's a great alternative to your cage, your buck knives, things like that. Smaller production runs, but traditional USA made knife. Had somebody tell me this morning they really enjoyed the knife segment of the show. I know it's not your thing, but they really enjoy that. I was thinking about creating my own segment. <laughs> What's it going to be called? Well, like my favorite, maybe, kitchen tool. Oh, okay. okay. You can do that. Okay. Yeah, I think it'd be good. <laughs> All right, so we got to show people this right here. This right here is actually, i seen this on Facebook ad. So somebody overseas had done this wonderful Facebook ad on this stuff growing in. It was like a time mm -hmm. lapse time thing. Lapse. And I said, oh, that looks so familiar. I knew we cared to see it in this tat soy. T-A-T-S-O-I-E. Now, if you're looking for this seed underneath our categories in our seed category, it's under what we call the greens category. But I planted some of this, and it's wonderful. It does grow fast. Mm -hmm. It is this a bok choy type. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And we actually had some for some We had some in some pasta last night, and uh, it was really good. It tastes, it has a little strong taste, mm -hmm. I thought. More of a mustardy. Yep, yep. But um, it's stir fried up really well. It's an Asian green there, and it is it's a, it's a type of a bok choy. Let me put it that way. Really pretty. Show the bottom of it. Turn Easy it to grow, and we actually eat stems as well. Stems. Stems. Stems, stems as stems. well. Cut them up. So mm -hmm. there you have it. It's pretty. If nothing else. It's, it's good to eat. It's beautiful. What you got planted this week? Oh man, I'm getting ready to plant everything. I got okra planted in the greenhouse, and. Um, we're getting some roselle started. Sunflowers, sunflowers, zinnias. zinnias. Yep, greenhouse is busting. I planted my peppers in the raised bed garden. We was just talking about stevia. Well, go. I got stevia in the greenhouse, and I love the one thing I love for everybody to try when we go to the greenhouse. You got to taste my stevia because it's mind blowing. The taste of stevia. We got all kind of herbs, passion flower growing. Did it come up? It's it's working on it. I got some uh, I got some red sorrel coming up. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of things. Greenhouse is full. full. This is the time of the year when the greenhouse is great. All right, so now let's get in. Let's bring Tanya in because this is going to be amazing. Okay. Really well, I want y'all to meet my newfound friend. <laughs> Tanya and I can talk for hours because we love the same thing. I'm, I'm interested in soils. Now, I don't have the background or education that Tanya's got, but soils are interesting to me. They just really are. And your background is you're an agronomist. You graduated from UGA. When That's I, right. 
That's and your husband graduated from Auburn. Auburn, yes. So it's kind of interesting. True love, you cannot pick who you love. <laughs> you cannot. <laughs> yep. So uh, you've been working at Walters Lab uh, over Camilla, Georgia. The headquarters is in Camilla. That's right. Our but y'all got labs everywhere. We do. Our corporate office is in Camilla. Uh, we opened our Owensburg, Kentucky lab in 2000. Then we opened um, Warsaw, North Carolina, and I think like. 2013 and then we added the Mississippi lab last so it's wow. around in 2020 during COVID that we added it so we've got four labs um, do a lot of soil samples probably pull in soil samples from all states and we have um, imports so we imports from out of country as well really I didn't um, realize that Turkey Puerto Rico um, yeah. Chiquita Bananas is one of our customers so we pull in a lot from um, South America as well you know, soil samples from the home gardener standpoint, and I know you got way more experience with this than I do, but it's something that people have a tendency to put off because it's not necessarily, I, it's not sexy going out for oh, no, a little soil no, sample. No. And you don't get no instant gratification from it and all that, but not. it's something I tell people, it's the very first thing you need to do is pull a soil sample to know where your nutrient load That's is, right. to know where your pH is. I think it intimidates people to get that report back. I think it does too. It does. We get a ton of phone calls. You know, I got this back and, you know, I have no idea how to read it. Can you help me? And also with the um, wide amount of, the huge amount of social media that we have, people will own all the blog pages and the, and the gardening pages that they're on. They'll just see a thread and go with what something somebody else does rather than, you know, pulling, taking time to pull that soil sample and, and, so much and get that baseline yeah. um, on it. So. I, I, we, we talked about how we use the body and, and soil as a correlation and I say you know you wouldn't up your blood pressure medication without knowing if you have blood work and knowing if you need it or not so don't do not go out and grow something out knowing that baseline and knowing if you need it or not so much <laughs> misinformation out there there is oh it's, it's ridiculous we even on our robo road site we have it from time to time I try to moderate it somewhat but it is so frustrating because brother-in-law did this, brother-in-law did that, and it's not necessarily there's no basics to it. So it's so we're gonna try to we're gonna try to open it up a little bit and give people some knowledge today. So the, what in your opinion, what is some of the most importance of soil sample? From my standpoint, I think number one is pH. Right, that's probably the first thing that you you know obviously need to check for. If you check, you know we have so many parameters or so many things we can check on a soil sample but if you're not going to check for anything else check for the basic check for your p your phosphate your potassium your calcium your magnesium and your ph and at least get the recommendations on your crop or your garden your flowers whatever you're going to grow on that so you'll you'll with that you'll get your mpk recommendations and your lime recommendation at least if you don't want to go into the micronutrients you know that's fine um but in saying that, at least go with your basic soil sample. All right, so the pH, and this is where a lot of people get in trouble with. They want to go out there because Uncle Joe always put lime out every year. That's right. So the problem is, and I preach this over again, never, ever apply lime unless you know what your pH is. Absolutely. So your pH, <clears throat> we're going to get a little deep here. Okay. What does, what does pH stand for? Okay, so pH is potential hydrogen. Um, it's the acidity of your soil, the actual reading of acidity of your soil. And with how we test for pH in the lab, you know, there's a lot of handheld meters out that you can go out and stick in the soil. And we'll have people call in from time to time and say, well, hey, my pH was reading much higher, but I sent it in to you guys and it's much lower. But what we do is when the soil comes in, we dry it. So we take out all the moisture from it first thing. We dry it overnight. And then we grind it. And so it's powder fine, we're getting out all the clumps, we're sieving off all the sticks and rocks or anything that might be in there, organic material that might be in there. And then we run it one part water, deionized water, to one part soil. And when you do it that way, it takes out the meter, when you're using the meter in field, it takes out your moisture level, which is your water, which may have a higher pH. So it, you're, you can sometimes get a little bit of a uh, fictitious reading on that. But um, so the, we're reading it with hydrogen ions on our probes. So we're reading that potential hydrogen or that hydrogen reading is how we're getting our, and hydrogen is acid basically. Is so you said that the probes are not accurate? 
some um, some of them are but you have to watch if you've had a heavy rain or you've got something that's holding a lot of moisture in behind it and you're using the probe they also have to be calibrated but sometimes if you're using them you'll be picking up the moisture reading your pH your water may actually have a pH of a 7 or a 7.6 um, or an 8 so if you're it will pick up on that water sometimes so up. really if you're if you're gonna you know instead of sticking it straight into the ground and of course I know technology has advanced but take it out let it dry air at least air dry and then read it with so the our tap water pH <coughs> is around eight here yeah so that would make sense if I irrigated with my That's sprinkler right. if you have high moisture I went out there and took a sample or with one of the probes and I used to have one of those probes mm -hmm. I still got it around here somewhere that could actually cause my pH to be higher than That's what right. actually is in the So you're soil. getting a little bit of a boost on that, you know, increase on that pH. For the average home gardener, average home gardener, 6.5 is what you should shoot for somewhere in there? We push it on our acid soils that we have in the southeast. We target at a 6.5. One, because most of your nutrients are they're most readily available at that 6.2 to 6.5 range. The other reason being that you can push it up because it's going to drop during the growing season. You know, <clears throat> people will call in or they'll say, I don't understand because I limed, as y'all told me to last year. Well, then I grew my winter garden and I grew my spring garden and I pulled my soil sample again and my pH is back what it was last year. It's still at a 5.8. Um, well, during that growing season, you put out fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, which pushed your pH down. You obviously probably either irrigated or natural rainfall pushed the pH down. Your plants uptook some of that nutrients, so that pushed the pH down. So it's not uncommon in our sandy-based soils to have a 5.9, 5.8 pH, put out a ton of lime, grow a crop, and then the next year it be back at a 5.8, 5.9. That's the natural inclination of that soil to go back to its natural state. A natural <clears throat> state. So back in the, let's go back 200, 300 years when we had these hard wood bottoms and we mm -hmm. had our native soils here. Mm -hmm. All those leaves that accommodated on the ground, our natural pH is somewhere around, what, 4.8 or 5 in our natural Very soils. Mm -hmm. We need to manipulate that to 6.5 to grow vegetable crops. That's right. So we do that by taking a pH. We want that 6.5 pH. Let's take, for example, somebody does a soil sample and they got a 7.5 pH before mm -hmm. they allow any, oh, excuse me, put out any lime. Mm -hmm. They got a 7.5. At that point, it's a lot harder to try to control than it is trying to raise that. What would you do in a very high pH situation? In a high pH, if you want to bring it down, you can add sulfur. And I, we normally recommend elemental sulfur because it's usually around 90%. It's the most, it's the purest form of sulfur. Um, so typically that equation would be on a sand-based soil and it is, uh, the recommendation is according to sand, loam, or clay. But on a sand-based, a light soil that's easy to manipulate or easy to change, we're probably about, bringing it from a 7 to a 6.5, we're probably about 4 pounds per thousand square foot. Um, so that would be about 435 pounds per acre. Uh -huh. um, so about four pounds per thousand square foot. Now, if it was, if you had a heavier soil and it was a sandy loam or a loam, I think it goes up to about eight pounds per, and then it goes on up with a clay. So in saying that you have over a seven, it's not, you can't go out and if you had a heavy soil, you, it's not feasible to go out and put out 800 pounds of sulfur at one time. So you'd have to break down your applications into maybe two or three to constantly be pushing it down. And the problem <coughs> with sulfur is it's slow, <laughs> slow and it's mobile. Mm -hmm, it washes mm -hmm. out. So maybe right. something you have to do a couple of different That's times. Right. Once it changes over from that elemental sulfur, that sulfate form with the negative charge, it's, it pretty much is gone. So if you got a high pH and you want to and, and you want to bring it down, it's multiple applications right. of sulfur to get it down, and it's very hard. It's, it's not easy it's fix. It's time consuming. Now on the other side of that, we got a we got a 4.9 pH and we want to raise it to 6.5. Well, that's a fairly easy fix. Mm -hmm. Just add agricultural lime and, and we got buffer pH to deal with and we got yeah. regular pH. Mm -hmm. So how would you go about that? And y'all so have recommendations on soil samples. We do. We give a if you run a soil sample, no matter what, basically we have packets. You know, you have your basic, then you can add your micros. But you always get a pH and you always get a lime recommendation no matter what. So um, 
the pH is the, as we've mentioned, the actual acidity of the soil. The buffer pH is the buffering capacity of the soil. So it tells how much resistance that soil naturally has to the change in pH. A sandy soil, you can add a little bit of lime to it and it'll shoot the pH up. A clay soil, you have to add much more to it because it's naturally resisting that change. So on a sand, if you add a half a ton, you would bring it up, you know, 5.5, 0.6 points from a 5.5 to a 6.0. In a clay, you might have to add a ton or you might have to add, you know, a little bit more than a half a ton in order to push it up the same same amount. Normally <laughs> speaking, a general reference is a ton per acre per, per, per point, somewhere mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess the point we need to make here is it's easy to raise That's right. pitch. It is. <laughs> it's hard to lower right. that pitch. So never ever apply a lime until you know what your pH is. That's the that man. So many times I went out and seen people have yes. just rurt their garden. Rurt. That's a that's yes. a southern and, term. And, we and use. don't and don't put out your lime and then pull your soil sample and send it in because and or don't put out your lime and then turn your soil and send in your soil sample. Give it, you know, give it some time because obviously that lime is not going to break down. Agricultural lime is not going to break down at all at one time. It is not war all water soluble. So we're going to pick up some of that lime in with that sample. And when you, when you pull a soil sample and we said that we dry it overnight and grind it, anything that you put into that, we're still getting the particles from it, even though we grind it down into a powder. So we'll pick up that lime powder in that soil sample and it will shoot that pH, it'll shoot your calcium up and it'll shoot your pH up. So like you say, do not put out lime until you pull a soil sample. And if you pull a, if you put out lime and pull a soil sample, let us, let the lab know, whoever you're sending it to, let them know because they can, when they get really high levels, they can call you or they'll, they'll kind of know what's going on. Um, from that standpoint. So let's talk about when to pull a soil sample and how to pull a soil sample. Now, for the home gardener, normally would you say January, February is the best time to pull that soil sample? And how often does it need to be done? So I think, you know, for a home gardener, January gives them plenty of time to get their sample, to get it pulled, um, and to get it into us, get it back, and get the lime out so it can actually start working. On um, regular ag grade lime, it usually has three different sizes, small, medium, and large. And so the small is gonna almost instantly start to work and you'll get your first boost in your pH. Um, then the large, the next size will take a little bit of time. And according to how much moisture is in the soil, <clears throat> on years where we don't have a lot of moisture and it's really dry, you know, they say that it can take up to a year for that lime to actually break down according to the particle size wow. of it. So lime's been in kind of um, short demand or short supply and high demand recently. So there's been some samples that have come into the lab where people asking that's got really large particle sizes. So be careful with your lime. Look at your particle sizes. If you're getting it from, you know, if it's ag grade lime, you know, make sure and get a guaranteed analysis on it. And if you don't know, you know, if you don't know what that means, then call somebody, call us, and let's check. Make sure you're getting a good product because. So the smaller <coughs> the particle size, the quicker it is to activate. <laughs> They say that the smallest particle sizes, which will maybe pass a, a sieve of 100, which are a screen of like 100 to 200, it's pretty fine, and it will almost immediately start to work. But then the larger part, the, the other two particle sizes have to take, and it, it's according if you incorporate, if you didn't incorporate, if you laid it on top. There's obviously, there's always a lot of ifs or how you and do And for it. the home gardener, they could use a pelletizer. That's right. A lot of which has been been made into bigger particles, although it may have small particles in it, That's so right. it's been bound together, which is a lot easier to put That's out. That's right. Um, we kind of call it, think of it like a fine lime that's been compressed or um, what has been pelletized, and it breaks down much more quickly, and you can put out less of that than you can typically, but just go by the rate that's on the bag from, from that standpoint. But with soils, um, and I equate this to, I use this example a lot, Think about soils as kind of a pie pan or a pie. Mm -hmm. So if you've got too much of one thing in there, you don't have room to put something else in there. Sure. So if you're making a blueberry pie, this is a great, <laughs> blueberry pie is it's a great way hungry. to explain this. <laughs> but if you've got a 
what a lot of people don't understand about soils is you only have so much room in that soil colloid for nutrients. So if you overload it with one, what you're actually doing is pushing out something else. So the importance here is balance. That's right. That's what so many people kind of I think miss on the soil thing is the balance because they want to add this and add that. Well, when you do that, you push some of these things out sometimes. So on the on the normal sample on an NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. If you're high in one of those, more likely you're pushing something else out. And then we got these minors and major, well, major and minor elements to deal with there. Let's talk about uh, some of these weird samples. That, well, first of all, let's go over nitrogen. I want to okay. touch on this nitrogen thing. On our rubber road group, we see these soil samples come in, and a lot of them, I think, is from Texas, mm -hmm. where they're reading nitrogen on the soils. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that because nitrogen is mobile, it's hard to read. It's hard to read in a tissue sample, yeah. much less in a soil sample. Why are we seeing nitrogen in soil, these soil samples, and what's your opinion on nitrogen, read nitrogen with soil sample? Okay. So we typically do not run nitrogen on a soil sample. If we do, I want to run nitrate or ammonium nitrogen, the NO3 or NH4. Those are your two available or readily available forms. But like you say, nitrate, NO3 has a negative charge, the soil colloid has a negative charge. Organic matter has a negative charge. So opposites, repel, opposites attract, pos, uh, same sites repel each other. So that's gonna leach it out. <clears throat> the other reason why we typically don't run uh, nitrogen is due to the fact that we have sandy soil and it is more readily leachable, nitrate is, after you know rain or whatever. So um, we find that we usually, unless something, we know that something has been put out almost, you know, within the weeks or two, you know, a couple of weeks, we're not going to find very much nitrate, you know, three in that soil. <clears throat> in saying that, with the research that's being done now, there's a lot of people who want their nitrogen reading. So we, you know, that's why a lot of these companies will offer a extra option on running your nitrate. Um, if I was running a soil sample and I wanted to, I knew I had Either I had a lot of organic material that I thought was breaking down, because organic matter breaks down and you know you have nitrogen available, but you don't know when it's available. So I just normally consider it extra nitrogen. I would run, I would pull a multi-depth soil sample. So I'd pull a shallow, medium, or either and deep, or either a shallow and a deep um, through that soil profile. So you can see where it's at if it's leaching. You'll see where, where you can get it from. If you have mature plants in ground, or if you have like fruit trees or you know ornamentals, then you know their root systems are developed to the point that they can get that nitrate that's lower and deeper in that soil profile. But if you're transplanting or got new plants, you know if you don't have any in that upper area, you're, you need to apply. Because you uh, know your roots are not going to be developed enough to get the what might be deep. Yeah, I'm seeing some of these these universities doing nitrogen now, and I'm like, wow, that's that's weird, because they're so hard to read. And then, how much attention do you pay to those results? Because it can be it changes so it readily. changes so quick. It changes quite readily. So, for the most part, nitrogen is not something you really want to depend on from, with a soil sample. You because you could you know you could pull a sample today and you could get a heavy rain behind it, send a soil sample to us and we may report 20 or 30 pounds, but is it really still there? Yeah. You don't know, by, by the time you get those results back, and we're relatively quick, you know, two days you've got your results back, but if you've got a rain in behind it, is it still where it's supposed to be or has it leached out? So it's a guessing game at that point. And then you've paid extra to get nitrogen because it's an extra dip, it's an extra process from running your regular soil sample and you're still guessing at um, what you're doing. So, and that's the whole point of a soil sample is to not have to guess, to know with certainty what's in that soil. So let's move to the next one, which is Mr. Phosphorus. Mm. We see a lot of, in our area here, we see a lot of high phosphorus levels. And, uh, and soil samples there. What talk about what we should do if we got a high phosphorus level? What we should do if we got a low phosphorus level, and why we want that balance there? So phosphorus is like the cousin that nobody can get along with. It, it has problems with everybody, as well as um, itself, to be quite honest. So on a a low phosphorus, you know, I often tell my lawn care home owner, home owners and growers and gardeners. Um, a little bit is good, but a lot is not always better. And one of the reasons that I think that gardeners 
have such a hard time is that you know when when larger when farmers are putting out fertilizer they know that they're putting out on an acre two acres a hundred acres two hundred acres um, a gardener may be doing a 10 by 10 plot or he may be having a raised bed that's you know as big as this table so it's just so hard to gauge the amount that you're putting out and what often happens is you put out you input too much fertilizer or you know you, you've got a lot of manure that you're putting in there or you've got a lot of compost already in your mix in with your your native soil maybe that you have and so you put out a lot of fertilizer and then you get your levels up too high and with some elements as we've talked about how things leach you know ph goes down nitrogen leaches phosphorus does not leach um, it does not go down through the soil profile. It may move laterally across it, but it really doesn't go down and it doesn't it stays They one time I read that it stayed within a centimeter of where you put it So if you put out an actual grain in your fertilizer, you put out a, a grain of phosphorus in your um, Granular fertilizer then it, it basically only moved you know within a centimeter until that root system came in and got it but when you get those levels up so high, since it doesn't get along with everyone else, it, it tends to bond. It'll bond with calcium at high levels. It'll bond with zinc at high levels. Um, and when that happens, then your phosphate isn't available. And when I think of phosphate, you know, elements have, they work with each other and they work in so many different capacities within the plant. But when I think of phosphorus, I think of root development and growth. And what you see, what I often get uh, with customers is they'll call in and they had seeded some, seeded something, and they had transplanted. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, okay, well, I transplanted these three weeks ago. And after that, you know, they just started going down. They were beautiful. My tomatoes were beautiful. And then they started kind of going down, and then they got stunted, and then they just died. Or my grass, you know, my grass looks good, but it just won't tiller out. And I can go out there and I pull up, and it just, it just pulls up in my hand. That's phosphorus. It's tied up, or either you don't have enough, and um, it's not available to the plant. So and that's typical. With, and typically, when they run a soil sample, they'll have several, several hundred pounds of phosphorus in the soil, and so it's bonded, and it's unavailable. And so they're at the point that the root system can't develop and actually feed itself um, due to the fact that it, it can't have that, that phosphate, it's not available. So what do we do about high level of phosphorus? <clears throat> That's very difficult. <laughs> That's why a little bit is good and a lot is not always better because yeah. it takes a extended period of time for that phosphate. Basically the only way you can get phosphate out is, I often say dilute it maybe, dilute your, if you can dilute your area, incorporate something else in. Good deep compost. Yeah, deep, you know, deep till it um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, Plant uptake is your your option. And the very best crop for that <coughs> is either sweet or field corn. That's right. That's they, right. Uses corn a lot. loves phosphorus. Maggie's making her rounds over here. Absolutely. So um, so phosphorus. If you got high levels of that, plant you some corn out there and try to get your levels down. And then really watch it. Make sure that you don't apply any more because the last thing you want to do if you got high phosphorus levels right. is to add a 10, 10, 10 or whatever and add more to the problem. Because this can actually push some of those other nutrients out. That's right. Because, you know, we, when we talk about, you know, our primary, secondary micronutrients or macro versus micronutrients, with phosphorus being a macro, um, and they're like, well, I'm not concerned about my micros. But one thing phosphorus does is it will also bond or tie up your zinc. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't really think a whole lot about zinc, but zinc is actually the solar panel of the plant. And if the zinc is unavailable, then you have small leaves. And if you have small leaves, it's not making as much, it's not, your solar panel is not as big. So you don't have as much photosynthesis going on, your chlorophyll, you know, your energy levels, it, it affects the whole plant. <coughs> and it affects your crop yield. So in the end, we want our customers to have good crop yield. We want you to, if you're going to plant it and spend the time and effort and money, we want you to reap the benefits from it. So Potassium. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> potassium is the last one on that NPK, and potassium is, I, no, tell me your thoughts. I think potassium is kind of a mix between nitrogen and phosphorus. It has some of those benefits of each one of them, but it's extremely important as far as the plant goes because it is one of those major, major elements that our plants need. 
and it will it will leach more readily uh, obviously than the it's a cation it has a positive charge so each individual soil colloid has a negative charge and you think about your on every soil report we give the cation exchange capacity and we'll go into that in a little bit but potassium is one of those cations it has a positive charge so it's attracted to that soil colloid but it will it is it will leach uh, calcium is double bonded magnesium is double bonded so it will they will attach more readily and has a have a stronger bond but potassium potassium will um, actually leach out i think of potassium from a standpoint of your bloom color your bloom size fruit size um and so you definitely want to have that potassium at an optimum level we often say split apply potassium <clears throat> where you can put all your phosphorus at one time, split apply that potassium and kind of spoon feed it a little bit, that plant, because it is, um, it will be more readily available and you're not as likely to see it leach out and push out through that soil profile. But it does compete, in saying that, it will compete with calcium. Okay, which is important because <clears throat> we're going to talk about blossoming rot at the yeah. end of the show because everybody has trouble with blossoming rot. So if you're putting out your potassium and your calcium at the same time, calcium being double bonded, to that soil, potassium not, it's more likely to push it off or start pushing it down through that soil profile where it's not going to be as available. Right. All right. So did you bring a sample today? I did. I did. All right. So what I'm going to do so is we're going to hold this up here. Maggie Jane, sit down. We're going to hold this <coughs> up here and we're going to walk through what a soil sample looks like and you can kind of explain on each particular thing there what it is and, and the importance of it. Of uh, all that. Number one thing is we look at. Have you got an extra one I can yeah, look at? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, let me see. I'm going to hold this up where people can look at it. Well, that one doesn't have it. Okay. All right. So, um, on our school samples, across the top of the page, you will see actually your el your elemental analysis and your, rec and your results. These are your results that we found in the soil. Now, we do put a target pH on, which is 6.5. We have some customers. This is a court. This is 6.5 is for most crops. If you had a blueberry or azalea, that would probably be in much lower range. But unless otherwise specified or requested by the customer, we're going to go at a 6.5. So the pH on this one is a 7.1. We've got a 6.5 target. So there are no lime recommendation at the bottom of this sample. The phosphorus level is 6, which is excessively low. It's all on a bar graph, and you can see that the graph is on a um, very um, almost non-existent um, on this phosphate reading. That tells us that your root systems are not developing as they should, as well as the many other things that phosphorus plays into. And we would make a phosphorus recommendation. This recommendation is in most of our gardens and lawns. We do it in per thousand square foot. And so this is a uh, two pounds of phosphorus per thousand square foot. We went over, um, I see the nitrogen, and then we went over that we did not run nitrogen on this sample, although there is a place for it to be run. But we make a standard recommendation based off of the crop on the nitrogen uh, recommendation. So on the... Um, Potassium is next on the bar graph, and we're finding in those in a moderate range. I'm sorry, in a, actually in the low range. <coughs> and potassium um, deals with basically the stress of the plant and our South Georgia humidity that we have. It regulates the stomata on the plant leaf, on the leaf of the plant. And so it, it balances the water within the plant and helps with stress, um, heat stress and dry stress uh, from that standpoint. <clears throat> One thing that um, I meant to mention with um, phosphorus is also phosphorus sometimes will, um, if you have excessively dry soils and it's taken, it's, it's helping, it's, it's taken up better by the plant with moisture, with mass flow. So sometimes you'll see, if you have really dry periods, you'll see your phosphorus level um, in a lower, in the lower range as well. So um, magnesium is next. Um, magnesium is what we call a secondary element. Magnesium and calcium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium are all cations um, in the soil. So 
that is uh, usually you'll see your potassium, magnesium, and calcium results at the top, and then on the side you'll see your base saturation of your potassium, <coughs> magnesium, and calcium. Excuse me. Now the magnesium there, in case people don't know, when you hear somebody say, "Well, you need to apply some Epsom salt out there," well, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, so that raises your magnesium levels dramatically when you add that Epsom salt. So keep that in mind as we talk about a little bit later. We talk about blossom in right, that's gonna come back into play. Now for some reason or another, when most of the samples that we take in this area was our magnesium and our calcium, both were high. And it was not from... No, it, is, it just <coughs> na naturally. naturally runs high. And I can see that from the, you know, we have um, high calcium in our water table, so our our natural formation or our bedrock um, will have higher and calcium and magnesium. And they, they have it also in, there's a portion of middle part of Florida that has high calcium uh, levels and so they have re high really high pHs and you'll notice on this report it has up in the corner it has Melic 1 we run two extractions Melic 1 and Melic 3 in the lab Melic 1 is for um, low organic matter low C low CEC low uh, acid soils the Melic 3 is for higher organic matter um, higher CEC soils and also for higher, naturally higher pH soils. So Florida has actually changed their desired extraction to a millet 3 versus a millet 1 because they have those higher pHs <coughs> in the soil. <clears throat> then we get into sulfur boron, which is important for certain things such as beets, boron. You know, these are, these are elements that we don't need a lot of in the soil, but it's really important that you get a certain amount of these, especially on certain crops. Right, it is. Um, boron, we, typically we only target like a pound of boron um, per acre, but um, in the soil, and this one like has 0.9, <clears throat> but boron is o often overlooked. Uh, sulfur sort of mimics uh, nitrogen because mm -hmm. it helps nitrogen utilization. It's uh, essential in chlorophyll formation, uh, so it mimics um, nitrogen a little bit. So we often say if you put out nitrogen, if you can put out sulfur, then to put out sulfur because your nitrogen is going to be a little bit more efficiently taken up um, by the plant. Boron is unique in that it actually... Um, is a carrier for calcium. So it'll actually pull calcium up in the soil. Calcium, when we talked about the blossom end right a little bit, calcium doesn't move in the soil, in, in the plant. Uh, once it it goes in by mass flow or water, moisture is pulled wow, up. Wow, we go, we go. <coughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We start talking about that in a minute. I got something on it. So yeah, so it's not, it's not carried in very readily, but if you, if you have it, put out with boron or boron availability, boron will sometimes help carry it or suck it. We sell a product called Microbuse that has all those elements in it, and that really works well because they do work in conjunction with one another. Zinc, now zinc's important for you guys out there to love plant those picky trees. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and yes, definitely. Um, boron also helps with pollination. Oh, I didn't realize that. Um, it that's really just important for watermelons. That's, that's right. correct. Yeah, it I helps with the that. pollination and the pollen tube length. So um, it's definitely one with corn. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to put out um, boron. Along. I mean, you want to put out boron with everything, but when you're pollinating every little um, hair silk, on the right. corn, you definitely want um, boron there. Is that the reason they do some they do some foliar applications of boron right. on the commercial mm -hmm. corn? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, zinc from that we mentioned the leaf, the actual leaf size, or the help with the um, with the sizing of your leaf on the um, on the zinc. It also um, and the zinc on the oil crops. One thing that's kind of interesting with zinc is that um, peanuts is an oil crop, but Peanuts do, does not like zinc. Really? If you have high zinc level, it will actually shut down the peanut and you'll have stunts. So but, it's toxic to the peanuts. But with Tree pecans nuts. being the same oil nut, you would think that, um, but then it can't get enough. And corn as well. Corn is a big, um, it takes up zinc as well. But when you say, um, you know, um, all fruit like a pecan um, you don't think of a pecan or an almond as being a fruit but it actually is it's a fruit inside of a, a edible fruit inside of a inedible core exterior yeah. structure 
And then we got, of course, we got magnesium, we got iron. Now, irons and, and, and copper, all these are needed in little bitty small measurements for the plant. Uh, iron, we see that. Uh, I'm getting back to my turf grass days. Mm -hmm. Iron's mm -hmm. a big one in oh, turf absolutely. grass. If you got iron deficiency in your plants, you're going to see that somewhere in there because you, your leaf's going to look a little uh, anemic. Yeah, that chlorophyll synthesis that iron takes place in, and also some disease, is, it helps with disease as well. Um, on that. So iron is something we typically don't have a problem with in our area as well as areas that have high clay content usually don't have a whole lot of problems um, with iron. But uh, extreme sandy soils like in Florida they'll have iron, some iron issues um, there. Alright so then we got this move <coughs> to the next line here. Now this is the things you can pay extra for to get sampled. I guess. Uh, so let's talk yeah. about soluble salts. That's an okay. extra charge that to get is. that. And you, you need that if you've applied a lot of commercial fertilizer That's over right. a long period of time because your salt buildup can get big then. So, or if you're on a coastal area that yeah. has saltwater intrusion or if you're you know on the beach where you're even getting salt blown in uh, off the coast. So a soluble salt, we actually run it as a measurement of electrical conductivity. The higher the salt in the water, the more the le uh, the more likely it is to conduct electricity. So um, <clears throat> we would give a reading. You know, a lot of times, like small. This is another reason why you need to run. This is a good example of why you need to run a soil sample if you're if you think you might have some of those issues. Then you can, if you had high soluble salts, you could actually choose plants that are salt tolerant. So you'll have less, you know, less of an issue. Like we mentioned, the pH with the blueberry low low pH on blueberries versus um, on higher pH. Or you could change your fertilizer strategy, just let it use right. more organic fertilizers right. than, than store-bought fertilizers. Organic matter. Now this is a big one right here. Let's see if I can find it right there. Organic matter, I'm mm -hmm. talking about right there, mm -hmm. folks. And this is an additional charge that you can pay to get your, done to your soil sample here. Now, I always find organic matter in the soil a good indication of how well someone has managed their soils. Absolutely. Now here in the deep south where we live at, if you've got a four or five percent organic matter, you you're special. You need to have a birthday party yeah. because like it is. Yeah. Now our friends up north, it's nothing That's for right. them to have that type of That's organic right. matter. But us down here in the deep south, we struggle to get three to four to five percent. And I'm talking about the garden situation. That's right. We, we on, struggle on, to get that. On average, I would say that our typical soil sample is less than one point five percent. Right. In fact, it would probably be nearly impossible to have a 5% organic matter steady oh, in absolutely. our region down here. Absolutely. No doubt. Yeah. Anytime you're, especially with, you know, if you if you go outside of the typical garden and you're talking about anything that's conventional oh, till, yeah. it, it's in the point three, it's less than half of a pound. Of and that's important. Matter. Your organic matter is important because that tells you how well your soils are going to be able to hold That's nutrients, right. the nutrient holding capacity of your soil there. All right, so let's move on down to what this one right here, because I think everybody will find this interesting, cation exchange value. Okay. So the CEC, or cation exchange capacity, um, that is basically telling you your soil's ability to hold those cations. And we talked about the cations is potassium, magnesium, and calcium, but basically, Everything on here is a cation, with the exception, oh, on the, at least on the top, with the exception of phosphorus. Phosphorus is not a cation, and sulfur is not a cation. Anything that has A-T-E on the end, like eight, sulfate, borate, um, phosphate, they're all, those are not cations, so they have negative, that has negative charges. Um, so the cation exchange capacity. Typically in our area, it's less than three to five percent. As a home gardener, this is something you should strive to Absolutely. raise up. Right Absolutely, because it's gonna it's gonna hold your nutrients better. It's gonna hold your um, it's gonna help moisture as well. Hold your moisture a little bit better. But when you have a higher CEC, you also have to add more fertilizer in order because basically what the CEC is, if you imagine. Um, a softball <clears throat> and it has all these little negative charges floating around this softball. The cations are the positive charges so they're going to attract to those and there's only so many sites around that softball that they can attract to. So if you've got your potassium, your magnesium, your calcium saturating all those little sites and nitrate comes in, 
Well, nitrate has a negative charge. It's not going to be, so it's going to drop down through. So it's going to, they're going to kick it off and it's going to drop down through the soil profile. But as you build your CEC, you get more sites. So then you've got, if you don't continue to add fertilizer or your organic fertilizer doesn't break down, your organic matter, your compost doesn't break down, you're going to have sites out there that has nothing on it. Well, what happens then is acid comes in, the hydrogen comes in and takes over that site. And then it starts kicking off. As you add fertilizer back to it, then the calcium will come in and attach and one calcium will get knocked off. Well, when that calcium gets knocked off, it's actually in the soil solution. It is plant available. What is holding is actually, it's there, it's a reserve. But when you add more and one gets knocked off, every time one comes on, one gets knocked off, then that is in your soil solution and that is plant available. So as hmm. your CEC goes up, you have to add more fertilizer or have availability of more um, in order to keep off your sites totally saturated. So that's the exchange part. When one comes in, one gets knocked off, they exchange. And it plays into <clears throat> our organic matter somewhat. Absolutely. We normally see high cation exchanges <coughs> yes, when we see high organic matter. Yes. In soils. Because your organic matter has a negative charge too, so it helps with that um, exchange. It helps with that holding since the, the soil or the clay has a negative and the organic matter has a negative. It still helps with the holding capacity of it and the building of the number of sites that are available for it. So all that sounds fairly complicated, folks. And but the, the reality is down here at the bottom, we have comments down there that gives you the easy peasy of what you need to yes. do right there. So if you if you don't want to get knee deep in it like Tanya and I love to get into it sometimes, you can come down here and read the general recommendations of what you need to do right there. And do those recommendations. Those recommendations are there for a purpose because we just took all this information up here, you know, into account to come up with these recommendations down here. That's the reason this soil sample is so important because you actually have facts to base any recommendation that you want to do it on. That's right. And once we get the, you know, like a lot of people will, you know, you might change, you might decide you want to do something different, you might change your crop. Um, once we get the soil sample ran and you get the results on it, then we just can go in and change the crop. We call it a crop K. We go in and change crop K. So if you say, okay, well, I want to plant corn. Well, no, I changed my mind. I want to plant some zinnias. Okay, well, just call us. You know, most labs have that cap I mean, that capability. That's pretty typical. You don't have to send in another soil sample. Once you have the results, they can just apply the new hmm. crop code to it and change the results out and send it right back out. So. All right, so let's talk about Blossom and Rock. Blossom and Rock gives our customers the most fits come June and July, just about anybody does. Now, Blossom and Rock, we can have it on different fruits, tomatoes mainly. Right. We can also have it on peppers. We can have it on mm -hmm. watermelons. Any of these fruits can have Blossom and Rock. So many people get frustrated with it. And look here, I still have a little blossom I right had, from time I had it last year on some peppers. Yeah. I really did. So it's not something that you're ever going to be completely rid of. It's going to be something you have to battle. But there's so much misinformation out there. The basic premise on blossom and rot is, is, is a calcium deficiency. Absolutely. But there's way more to it That's than true. that. So we got to get that, as you mentioned, we got to get that yeah. calcium to the plant. So although we got a high calcium level on our soil sample, does that mean it's necessarily going to be available to that plant? No. Calcium's function is um, cell wall strength. And so that's what blossom and rot is. It's the breaking down of that tissue, you know, because the, the calcium's not there. Calcium does not move within there. You have mobile and non-mobile nutrients within the plant. So going with that, let's go ahead and get this one out of the way to okay. start with. These sprays that you buy, Blossom and Rot sprays, where you spray that leaf for Blossom and Rot, I've told people for years, you're wasting your money. And I know these people out there that will disagree me left and right, but I cannot, calcium does not move backwards in the leaf to get in that fruit at a substantial rate to strengthen the cell wall of that plant. No. It just did not move that way. Calcium moves one way and that's straight up. By, by mass flow. Only by mass by flow. Most. It don't move backwards. That's the reason those sprays, people buy these sprays, they, you waste your money. So calcium goes into the plant only by the xylem which goes up and it's with moisture that goes up through the xylem. Once it gets into the lower leaves of the plant, which are the old old leaves, um, or the, 
I guess they're new leaves in the beginning, but they're considered old leaves as the plant grows. Um, it then has no way of getting into the phloem in order to go to the fruit of the plant. Now, I know that technology has come a long ways and there are certain for certain products that say that they can get it into the plant through new technology and I have no information on that. They market it that way. Common sense tells me it can happen. <clears throat> I, have, I, have, I have no way of knowing. <laughs> um, but in saying that, once if you're taking a granular fertilizer, granular calcium, it will go into those lowest leaves. It will not translocate into the newer leaves and it will not translocate into the fruit. So calcium is one of those things that you have it high in the soil. You need to continue to, I think, apply it as a side dress as well during your growing season. But the best way to get calcium into that is through drip or inject injection, a water soluble. Gypsum application. A granular gypsum application? No, I mean, I mean, granular gypsum will help, just like lime will help. But it's still no, there's no guarantee. There's still no guarantee. Well, calcium is smooth. You but said it, but 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 it is more gypsum is it is more readily at a later available at a if you apply it later than you apply. But it. we got to get that okay. calcium up into the plant. We have to do it with like mm -hmm. said, water. Yes. So you have to have water. So That's if right. you have drought, if your plant stresses yes. from water. The calcium could be there, but it's not moving. Blossom in rot, right, and of course you can see it at any time with any person, but it seems to be more susceptible in uh, raised beds and small containers due to the how they dry out more quickly than, you know, in ground or larger beds or larger um, areas. So, yes. So, you got to have the calcium there. Mm -hmm. Then you got to move the calcium. Mm -hmm. So, the plant's got to be healthy. It's got to be willing to uptake. Then, we've got to have enough moisture there. That's right to move that calcium up in the plant. Right. If we do that and have good soil structure, then we've done the best that we That's can. Right. Now, one thing I've noticed over the years is good, high organic matter makes a difference in yes. my garden yes. as far as battling off oh, absolutely. Of rot. absolutely. Because that moisture is more consistent. It helps the moisture be more consistent. And I don't know if I confu we confused, but yes, cal lime or gypsum both are pro calcium products that can be utilized throughout your growing season. To, right. to help prevent it. Um, but organic matter is keeping that moisture more consistent as well as um, compost breaks down the calcium. So you've got a, a total or you know, total um, calcium product that's being broken down and coming available during your growing season that's offering calcium as well. So, so as we talk about this right here, we, we go back to how important balance is. So we always see this every year. People come on our, our group and they say, you got to add Epsom salt to take care of blossom and rot. Well, we know magnesium and calcium displace one another. So the fact of the matter is, adding magnesium sulfate, Epsom salt, can make your blossom and rot worse. Yes. Because you're actually pushing that calcium to the side. Yes, because it's competing. They're competing with one another as well as... Um, the sulfate part is leachable, so to me, um, it's going to cause that magnesium level. It's going the magnesium will be more likely to leach with Epsom salt because it's attached to that sulfate side, and sulfate is leachable. Right. So if you have this older plant that you need to get calcium to, how do you do it? Well, you have a good soil system. You have the right amount of balance in there. You make sure to set the calcium is available, and you make sure that plant doesn't stress. Now what you don't do is go down to the store and buy one of those sprays that you spray on the leaf there and you don't add magnesium sulfate to your soil there to try to count it because those two things don't work. So the, the, the answer is, is you got to have calcium, it's got to be available and you got to move it. What about putting the egg in the hole? Egg in the hole? It's going to take a long time. We get this all the time. <laughs> egg shells. Well, yeah, grinding down the egg fish. shells. People bury fish. Tums. Tums. Now, tubs will work. It's soluble. It's soluble, but I tell people there's I don't know, easier what, I don't know way, what percent. <laughs> there's easier ways to get there than, than putting less the tubs expensive. in. Less expensive. <laughs> less expensive. Way less expensive. But the, the eggshells and the fish and all that over a period of years could make things available, but it's not going to help 
with immediately. A immediately or Because any, I mean, any organic material that you add, any compost, you know, the manures and things, I mean, they're gonna they're gonna break down, and you know, with with good microbial activity, and that's a whole another bottle of wax. But with good microbial activity, um, they're gonna be breaking down all of those things into available nutrients. But you just don't know when those are. You can't say, okay, well, if I plant these in February, March, then it's going to be available in August or September. Um, so you don't know, but it will become available. But I think m multiple applications, you know, if you want to put some gypsum or lime in the hole when you do, if you're transplanting, and then maybe, you know, do another side dress, you know, up underneath. Um, we don't want to recommend doing it first bloom shed. Is that yeah. your recommendation? First bloom is when bloom, it really bloom needs sheds. to. What I think is the optimal time to put that gypsum around a tomato plant. Um, so uh, first bloom would be your, your time to put it out to make sure it's available. And, and another thing, too, don't put it on one side of the plant. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sprinkle it all the way yes. around because believe it or not, it'll take it up just on that one yes, side. Yes. So you got to. Anything that you're, anytime you're going to put out, you know, a fertilizer or product, you need to put it, we say, under the canopy of the plant. So that applies to an uh, oak tree, a fruit tree, or tomato a, plant, or or tomato yeah. plant, small plants. All right, so we've covered a lot of stuff here today on soil samples. How often should you pull a soil sample in your garden? Okay, so I think you should probably just pull one. You know, it's according if you're how intense you're gardening, obviously. But if you're doing a fall and a spring, I would pull one before each. You know, so two samples per year? You know, if you're making a lot of changes. If you're not making a lot of changes, you're consistent in your routine and you're not turning it a whole lot, you know, you are doing a no-till type situation, you can probably pull one, just one every year. But you know, the results are only as good as the sample that was taken. So know how to take it, know the depth to take it, be consistent with taking it, and pull a representative sample of that area. So let's just say somebody's got a quarter of an acre barn. Mm -hmm. How many samples do they need to pull from that quarter of an acre barn? So I normally say you pull eight. To ten for one sample. Mm -hmm. Like you go in, you know, you can use your hand trowel, you can use your clean, your clean hand trowel, your clean shovel, your stainless steel, stainless steel. You know, a soil probe if you have one. Pull multiple sites, mix it together in a plastic clean bucket, um, and then put it in. If you don't have a soil bag from whoever, whatever lab you use, you can put it in a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag, and label it so you know where it came from. If you have to say. You know, Mama's yard on the left-hand side. To say Mama's yard on the left-hand side is where you got it. From. And then you know exactly what your nutrient load of your soil is. You know exactly what you can apply, and you can change your strategy to make your plants happy. That's right. If you don't do that, you kind of fight in the battle to start That's with because right. you don't really know what your 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 plants need or what they got available. That's right. So it's the probably the uh, least um, least cost for the biggest bang in the end that you can get absolutely <coughs> yep well thank you you're welcome we covered a lot but it was good we did. i even learned a couple of things <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> i did I learned a lot. <laughs> all right well thank you maybe we gotta do this again sometime How yeah we that? need to um next time I, i'm gonna call it we're gonna go over microbial activity oh that'd be like good. Yeah, DNA. Yeah, yep that would be good <laughs> all right well thank you tanya thank, thank you thank you all right garden spotlight of this week is tara Timberman. Sheila, you have to know. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll say what it is. Triple T Homestead, and she's in zone 9A in Texas. A uh, couple photos from her garden. Um, wow. The first one is where she planted potatoes. Um, she's planting broccoli, uh, cabbage, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, squash, green beans, black eyed peas, and melons. Looks like she got a drip tape out there. Mm -hmm. There's a bees working. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, Hall Souls has been a huge part of my garden journey that started in 2020. Thank you for all you do. Oh, and always make the bees happy. Is that a tea olive, you think? I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. We've got a couple of tea loves in that house. You know, one thing that I've made a conscious effort, and, and I'm doing this, so I got rid of my bees, my, my managed beehives. <laughs> My goal, mean bees. Mean bees. My, my, my goal this year is to create a healthy habitat for native pollinators. I agree. 
Last year I seen a dramatic increase in my native pollinators, so this year I'm, that's one of my goals. They're already out. They're that's, already out. Yeah. So, and I got wild honeybees. Mm -hmm. So what are your, what are you planning? What are? You... Well, my goal is to have something for them to feed on. Mm -hmm. Right now I've got super beef and mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Of course, we got other things planned, but I got soup. I got butt wheat coming along. Believe it mm -hmm. or not, it's a little too early for butt wheat. But it's some volunteers that came back. But I got super beef acidia that the bees just love. Mm -hmm. So maybe I got something when that goes to the wayside. Mm -hmm. I need something else. We always plant zinnias and sunflowers. Yep. And, yep. I had some bees bomb last year. Quite oh, a that's bit wonderful. that they loved, and I loved it too. Yep. It is. It I smell beautiful, pretty, but I really like the bees bomb. Yeah. Also, a lot of different things you can do. There. We're doing a wildflower garden down at the house down there. And it's always got something blooming in. Mm -hmm. But I would highly encourage you, if you've not done that before, really think about your native pollinators and keep them in mind and try to increase that population as much as you can. All right. So we got to get to garden. No, we got to get to the old goat. Mm -hmm. All right. The old goat is on set here somewhere, folks. And if you find the old goat, put it in the comments below. Next week we'll do a drawing for next this week we'll do a drawing for this week's winner. I got that straight up. All right. Wanda Hughley is our winner for this week. Our good friends, the Hughleys. They was actually up they this was morning. actually here this morning picking up some orders. And we'd already done the drawing by then. So Wanda does Wanda know she no, won? I didn't Wanda know. does not know she won. <laughs> so Wanda. You will be sent, and we got your address, and so you should just send it to us. We're going to send you a wonderful pair of Get Dirty Socks. Now, if you've got a pair of these Get Dirty Socks on, you are the envy of the neighborhood. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for joining us. We had a great show. Oh, man, I could talk soils all day long. You know, if I had to do it again, I'd think I'd be a soul scientist. You can. You can still be one. I can still be one. Still I be think one. it's a little late. Yeah. It's a little late. But I do enjoy, I enjoy, and I know it's kind of weird because it's kind of nerdy, but I do enjoy it. I, I really find it fascinating. Yep. All right, folks, thank you for joining us. Now it's time for you to get out there and get dirty. <laughs>